Lord Jesus, there is nothing on this planet that compares to the greatness of knowing you. Lord, I would rather have you than anything else. God, you, you're it. Lord, let my mind be focused on you, my speech be clear and concise as I speak about you, and my soul bring glory to you. In your name, Jesus, amen. That is one of those songs that just gets me every time, guys. The more and more I am a Christian, and the more and more I experience life, <laughs> I realize the junk of this world can't compare to Jesus. It just, it just can't. Mm. Um, over these last few weeks, we have been in the book of Ephesians, and I've got good news for you. We're halfway through chapter one. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Sorry. Uh, uh, we uh, we took a break last week for Father's Day. Uh, we got to see the the uh, the amazing father. I love that. Uh, I love that story. Um, but our first week, uh, we talked about the blessings of grace in Ephesians chapter one, verses one through three. And then our second week, we talked about the blessings of redemption. And this week, we are going to talk about the blessings of salvation. And I think oftentimes we don't realize what our salvation really entails. I think we take for granted sometimes the fact that our salvation is not just a once in a lifetime thing. That we are saved at one point, but we, are, we continue to be saved throughout our life. That Jesus Christ continually saves us. And so we're going to see that this morning. And we're going to see how our, our purpose and His great design and how he has created the universe, how all of that works together for his salvation. And we're going to see this morning the three results of the blessings of salvation. So the first one we're going to see, we're just going to dive right in this morning. First, first one we're going to see is the hearing of truth. Verse, verse 13, the first half of it says, In him, this is in Jesus Christ, in Christ, you also after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So the first part says, in him you, after listening to the message of truth. Now, I, have a, I have a question to ask you as it relates to truth this morning. And, and your parents might be the better, better people to ask this question to if you're a child. Um, but are you a good listener? Or, or if you're married... Would your husband or your wife say that you're a good listener? As we know, as adults and kids, kids learn this as they grow up, but there, there are various levels of listening. I mean, as strange as it sounds, there, there are various levels of listening. We listen in different ways. We have, we have the radio, for instance. You can be driving down the road or cleaning your house or uh, playing in your backyard, whatever it is, and, and you have the radio on, and you're listening to it, but you're not listening to it. You know, if your favorite song comes on the, ro on the, on the radio, or, or Pandora, or whatever method you use, you, you hear it, you may even, you know, hum the lyrics in your head, but you don't stop to focus on that song necessarily, unless it's a song you really like, obviously, right? And then there's the kind of listening, like, and, and everybody knows I have, I have four children, um, you don't see them today. They're with, with my parents uh, for a week. Um, anyway, uh, but I have four children, and uh, as anybody who has had kids knows, uh, they come up to you at the most random times in the world, and they start talking to you. You know, even if you're talking to your spouse, or even if you're on the phone, they start talking to you. And so you have to do your best to multitask. You have to do your best to, to, to talk on the phone if you're on the phone, or you know, if you're talking to your spouse or, you know, cooking dinner, whatever it is, and listen to them while they're talking about their latest, you know, coloring creation that it doesn't really look anything like what they colored, but they think it does, and so you go with it, right? Or, you know, this amazing Lego set that they just built or whatever it is, they're, talk they're talking to you, and you're listening to them, but you're obviously, your attention is divided. 
you know, you're, you're trying to, to multitask and do two things at once. This is not that kind of listening, okay? I call this the, the lean-in listening, okay? Um, and and the, the best analogy I can use when I say lean-in, and, and sometimes you guys do it, maybe it's because you're just sleepy and you just don't want to fall asleep, but you'll be in the pew and you'll go from sitting up like this and you'll kind of lean in and you'll put your arms and you'll kind of do this. Y'all know what I'm talking about? The lean-in listening, it's like all of a sudden I want to hear what this person has to say. You know, my attention is 100% focused on what they are telling me, and everything else is being blocked out. I don't care the phone calls I get. I don't care about anything that I'm hearing right now. I want to listen to what it is I'm being told. It's that kind of listening. And we see the importance. We see why they're listening in this case, why they're leaning in, because they're hearing something that is unique. Because it says they listening, they are listening to the message of truth. Now, you and I may have one standard of truth, but the world has way too many standards of truth. As, as we know, if we if we look around at our world right now, they throw out words like tolerance and love, but the minute that you take a stand, you are no longer tolerant, you're intolerant. So the truth of your tolerance and their intolerance collide. It butt heads, right? The world's truth moves around. It's kind of like a deer at, at hunting season. You want that sucker to hold still, and it just keeps walking across the clearing, and you're like, stay put, and it just won't stop moving. Well, that's the world's truth. It just keeps going everywhere, right? Well, the good news is, in this case, our truth is different. Truth as a definition is this. It is a judgment, a proposition, or an idea that is true, or this is the kicker, or accepted as true. So when this says they're listening to the message of truth, they are listening to something that they are accepting, that proposal that they are hearing is truth to them. It's being presented as truth, and they're listening to it as truth. And that is vitally important. In fact, I, I, I love that fact that it's talking about in him, and in him is Jesus, because Jesus himself says this in John chapter 14, 6. It says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if you look at that passage, Jesus is saying, I can tell you where to go. I can tell you how you should think, and I can tell you what life should be like, because I'm it. It gives us a focal point. It gives us a bullseye. And the wonderful thing about that is, is because Jesus is truth, we can take truth and we can line it up to what we're being told and go, no, that's not truth. That's lies. That's deception. One of the truths that we live by is this. It's in Matthew chapter 28. It says, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Well, we've accepted that truth, but why is, it, why is this such a big deal? Why is it such a big deal that we accept this truth, and what should we do about it? Well, we're going to see that in a minute, but ultimately speaking as Christians, Romans gives us a clue as to why the Great Commission and our teaching others truth is such a big deal. And it's one of my favorite passages because Romans 10, 13 is right before it. Right? All who call upon the Lord shall be saved. Well, 14 and 15 follow with this. It says, how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? Who they have not listened to? How will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as, it is, just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news to good things. See, when you bring truth into somebody's life, you are changing their life. We talked about the gospel this morning and how it is good news, so much so to the point where we just can't understand it. It is a mystery. It's unfathomable. We used two words this morning in Sunday school, propitiation and expiation. 
two really complicated words that are beautiful and wonderful to us because it tells us what Jesus has done and because it's true. Jesus took the wrath of God for us. He appeased God. He reconciled us to God. He removed the wrath of God from us, took it on himself. That is good news, and that's truth. But the middle part of this says something here in Romans. It says, how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? See, so often we think about truth as something that we need to hear. But Matthew 28 just told us, hey, you know what? Truth isn't just something that we need to hear. It's something that others need to hear. Because when others hear truth, you know what it does? It shifts the way that they think. And I don't know about you guys, but I've looked in the last couple of weeks at what the world's doing right now. The world needs a shift change in the way it thinks. In a big way. But how does that happen? Well, Romans says, how will they believe in him? Well, what are they believing in? Well, that gets us to the second point. They're believing in the gospel. But what is the gospel? Why is that important? Middle of 13 says, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. There's two key things there. It's a gospel and it does something, right? It's not just anything. It's, it's, it's something that does something to you. This is the gospel of salvation. But more importantly, it says believed. And what is belief? Okay, I believe that I'm the husband of Kate Cook. I'm the, I believe that I'm the, the pastor of First Baptist Clarendon. I'm the, the daddy to four children. I'm the son to Frank and Linda Cook. I, those, are, those are beliefs that I have, not just in my mind, but I have faith in them. I'll go down fighting. Somebody tells me, you're not the husband of Kate Cook. I'll say, well, I beg to differ. I've got a signed marriage certificate, and I've got a ring, and I was in front of God when I said I wanted to spend the rest of my life with her, so you're wrong, and I'm right. I have the truth. Why is that such a big deal? Because the gospel is the truth in this case, and it's the gospel of salvation. So what is the gospel? Well, 1 Corinthians gives us a beautiful clue. And one of the things I love about the Bible is the Bible interprets itself. Scripture interprets Scripture. I don't have to take the Bible and interpret it on my own. I can take the Bible and use the Bible to interpret itself. So what's the gospel? Here you go. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4 says this. And this is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I received. Paul's saying, if there's nothing else you hear from me, there's nothing else you listen to from me, there's nothing else you get from me, this is the most important thing ever. And I cannot disagree with him on this. Because it says that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, truth, and he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. So Paul is saying, look, it's true what you're hearing. The gospel, which is Christ died on the cross for our sins, he was buried and raised from the dead, according to God's word. Because if it's not according to God's word, then it can't be truth. According to those three things, that is the gospel. I, uh, I listened to a, um, a sermon a few years ago. And I'd heard it for the first time, but not spelled out like this. The gospel is an acronym. An acronym is a word that stands for something else. Right? Um, the gospel, God, our sin, paying everyone life. God, our sin, paying everyone life. God loved us so much. It's John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the gospel. And ultimately speaking, if we think about it, the gospel is the cross. It is Jesus on the cross and off the cross. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4 says it like this. Surely our griefs he bore himself and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced the wrists for our transgressions. He was crushed the whipping and the bruising for our iniquities. 
the chastening of our well-being fell upon him. By his scourging, we are healed. It is Jesus Christ dying on the cross, bleeding for our sins. But then Hebrews tells us the part about being raised from the dead. It says this, For Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of, the God, of God, waiting for that time onward, until his enemies become a footstool for his feet. Old Testament, something must die. New Testament, something does die. But here's the thing. There's two crosses. There's the cross that's empty, and there's the cross that many people still wear, a lot of Catholics wear this, that has Jesus still on it. Well, if Jesus is still on it, if Jesus is still on that cross, it is not a gospel of salvation. Because Jesus is still dying for our sin. He hasn't been resurrected. Here's why his resurrection is so important. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 4 through 18. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching, the proclamation of the gospel, is in vain, and your faith also is in vain. And then it gets even more heavy. It says, moreover, we are found to be false witnesses, liars of God, because we testified against God that he raised Christ, who he didn't raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, here's the, here's the part that you need to brace yourself on. Your faith is worthless. It is of no value. If, if the resurrection has not happened, what we are doing right here this morning is pointless. And we should all walk out those doors and go do what we want to do. But it has. And that's why it saves. Because when you believe in the gospel and you believe in the truth, you'll live for it. You'll die for it. It's something that, that you'll tell everybody about. This morning we were talking about in Sunday school, sidebar, if you don't go to Sunday school, go to Sunday school. That, that is the worship before worship. We're talking about in Sunday school about teaching people about the amazing mystery of, of God and the good news that's unbelievable. That, that's like, how, how, can this, how can this be possible? And we were talking about how sometimes you, you just can't tell somebody one time. You have to continually tell people the gospel. The gospel isn't just a one-time event. Well, why can it be that way? Because we believe in it. Because it's something that we allow to become part of us. It's something that we allow to take into us and we put our faith in. Ultimately because we have hope in the gospel. Now, if we look at our world today, do you see hope? If there is one thing that we are sorely lacking in addition to truth, it's hope. We need a little bit more hope. We need a lot more hope. Second Corinth or Second Timothy chapter one verse twelve. In fact, we kind of sang the sang the the verse this morning. It says this: For this reason, I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I believe in, and I am convinced. I love that word that He is able to guard what I have entrusted to Him until that day. Paul had entrusted his salvation to Jesus. Here, here's why this is such a big deal, gang. Because when you hear truth, when you hear the proposition of something that's life-changing, you make a decision to do something with it. You take that, that life-changing thing that you hear, and you do something with it. You believe in it. And you are believing in a gospel of salvation. Well, why is that important? Because here's what you're ultimately deciding. You're deciding that Jesus Christ's Death, burial, and resurrection are worthy of you setting aside all of your idols and worshiping Jesus Christ alone for the rest of your life. What you're ultimately saying is, truth has value in my life, the gospel has value in my life, and I'm going to believe in it. That's why Paul says, I am convinced. Think about, think about it this way, the soldiers that get caught by, by our, our enemies and they get tortured. 
they're convinced of something greater than themselves to the point where they won't reveal secrets. They're convinced of something that they have to keep inside of them. In our case, it's the reverse. In our case, it's we're convinced of something that's the best news ever, and we want to tell people about it because it's a mystery that God has made known to us, and we get to tell the world about it. It's that valuable that we want to tell everybody who we encounter about it. Because God decided everybody is valuable in my eyes. I'm going to send my son to, to, to die on the cross for them. The gospel of salvation is something that we believe in. We believe in the blessing of salvation. But once, we're, once we believe, there's something else that takes place. And, and, and I would almost say that you can't have the one without the other. It's kind of like in Paul's writings, um, a lot of times he'll say grace and peace to you. You can't have peace without grace. It's not possible. Well, here you can't have what we're about to get into, which is the salvation and the redemption of us. You can't have that without belief. Because it says this, at the end of verse 13, it says, having also believed. So because you believed, because you did this, you were sealed in him. So we go from hearing a message of truth to believing a gospel of salvation to being sealed and having a pledge of redemption through the Holy Spirit. Having also believed, you were sealed. At the moment that you were saved, you were sealed. At the moment that you were saved, you had the down payment on redemption. And in case you're like, down payment, Brother John, the gospel is not a house. You're right, it's not a house. It's even better than a house. Verse 14 says this, Who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to to the redemption of God's own possession. See, here's what happens. When we get saved, the Holy Spirit seals us. And, and a seal is a really big deal. We kind of discussed this a couple of weeks ago on, on Sunday night. Um, we talked about the seal of the Holy Spirit. A seal is something that, that when you take out a sheet of paper and you roll it up, they would take wax and they would make an impression. And it would seal it, kind of like what we would do with scotch tape, except like 10 times more awesome and amazing. Well, if that seal broke, then they knew it had been messed with. Well, in this case, when we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, not only is it closing it up, but it's securing it because it's now under the authority of the person that sealed it up. It's marking it. And here's the really cool thing. It's also saying it's authentic. So when you believe, when you're a saved, when you hear the message of salvation, when you come forward and publicly profess him as Lord, then you get baptized. When all those things take place, those are all marks of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is saying, yep, they're God's child. Yep, they're God's child. It's authentic. It's kind of like if you ever, uh, you ever, anybody in here ever watched the Antiques Roadshow? No, I'm the only one? Okay, a couple people are willing to admit it. Awesome. I love that show. It's so cool. You know, every now and again, they'll, they'll, uh, look, somebody will walk into the Antiques Roadshow and they have this thing that's supposedly worth, you know, millions and millions of dollars. And they have the certificate of authenticity, you know. And the, the appraiser who knows about this particular item will start looking at it and, and no, I'm sorry, but... If it were really authentic, it would have this and this and this, and you're missing those things. So I'm sorry to tell you this, but your piece isn't authentic. Well, in this case, the Holy Spirit is looking at us and going, okay, you, you have the gospel of salvation inside of you. God the Father looks at you and says, you have the seal of the Holy Spirit inside of you. You're authentic. You're my child. But not only that, but we have something even greater. It says, with a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption. Now, I'm going to kind of switch gears for you guys for a little bit. Um, with a view uh, can be better translated until the redemption. In fact, if you have the Holman Christian Standard Bible, it actually translates it that way. 
And here's the best way that I can explain things in terms of the activity. Um, think about a wedding ceremony. You have the bride and the groom come up, and you have, we'll say, the, broom, the groom's here, bride's here, you have the minister here. Do you, you know, the vows, and do you take, yes, I do, yes, I do, I promise to do all this stuff. You have the ring, and the groom reaches into his pocket, gets the ring out, and, you know, the, the minister will say, repeat after me, with this ring I thee wed. And they'll slide it onto the bride's finger, and then she does the same thing to the husband. And then the minister says, I now pronounce you man and wife. You may kiss the bride. Well, I love, I love marriage because marriage is all over the Bible. Well, here's kind of the way that I look at it. God the Father is the minister. Jesus is the groom. That Bible tells us that Jesus is the bridegroom. And we are the bride. We are the bride of Christ. Jesus, Revelation tells us that. So what happens is when we agree, when we say, yes, I want to be married to Christ. Yes, I, I want to have a relationship with Christ. Jesus takes the ring that he has because that's the symbol of marriage. He takes that ring, which is the Holy Spirit, and he puts it on the bride's finger, right? Jesus has marked you through the power of God, marked you with the Holy Spirit, right? Now, I can take my ring off, obviously, and I'm still married to Kate, right? But the marriage doesn't stop at the altar. The marriage goes on for years and years and years, Lord willing, until both husband and wife go on to see Jesus. Well, that's the same way with redemption. When we become saved, when we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, we get an initial deposit of redemption. We have accepted God's redemption of Christ and His blood on the cross. And so Jesus says, okay, here's the initial redemption. He slides that ring onto our finger. But there's a second redemption. And y'all are probably going, what? I promise you, there's a second redemption. First Thessalonians. Actually, let me read two, two passages of Scripture to make them connect. Romans chapter 8, verse 23. And not only this, but we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, right, that initial down payment when the Holy Spirit comes in and seals us, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. How many of us are groaning right now? We're like, Lord, please come. Please come, Jesus. We wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption, check us out, of our body. And what in the world does that mean? Well, again, using Scripture as our reference point, First Thessalonians, the Bible tells us this, chapter 4. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who sleep. So that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself would ascend with a, with, from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive will, and remain will be caught up together. That's where we get that word rapture from, caught up. Together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. See, our initial redemption happened spiritually when we got saved. But if you'll remember back in the garden, God said, if you eat this, you'll die. The actual phrase there is dying, you shall die. It means you're going to die in multiple ways. You're going to die spiritually, and you're going to die physically. See, what happens when we get redeemed is God redeems our souls. He redeems our spirits through the blood of Jesus Christ, and that's the first redemption. When Jesus comes back the second time in the sky, not for the thousand-year reign, which we'll get into in Revelation. We're starting Revelation tonight, so come on. When he comes back to meet us in the clouds, that's when he's going to finally redeem us. Because when he catches all his saints up into the clouds, he takes us back to heaven. Where we become, according to middle of verse 14, God's own possession. 
We have an initial redemption at salvation. We have a final redemption when we get to heaven to be with God the Father. That's why we can look in Revelation. It says there's not going to be any more tears or pain or anything like that because we're going to have new bodies. Our bodies are going to be redeemed. Our souls have been healed. Now our bodies get healed. So we hear the truth, and because we have heard it, it becomes an anchor in our life. We, we believe in that anchor, which is the gospel, and that anchor is the thing by which we, we live life. There, there's no other method by which we can live our life other than the Word of God. It must be our source. It must be the roadmap. And the reason we can do it is because we have a seal of the Holy Spirit. We've been redeemed by the Holy Spirit. We have the power of God inside of us. In fact, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, that same Holy Spirit lives in us. How cool is that? That same power, in fact, Jeremy Camp sings about this, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us, lives in us. That's how we get the power to witness to people. When we're nervous and we're shaking and our knees are quaking, we can walk up to somebody and say, Lord, please help me. I don't know what to say. Uh, that's a wonderful car you've got. And you just start a conversation. And the Holy Spirit fills you with, it, with His power. And that's how you can witness to people. Because you have that power. Because you've been redeemed. And that gets us to the last phrase of this verse. And I love this phrase. Because this phrase is mentioned three times in the first half of chapter 1. And if there's one thing I've learned in my very few years of preaching the Bible, it is anytime God says something more than once, you pay attention. It's mentioned three times. Three and seven are the numbers of completion in the Bible. So this is saying, okay, there's a complete thought here. To the praise and the glory of His grace in verse 6. Into verse 12, to the praise of His glory. Into verse 14, to the praise of His glory. All three times that they're talking about the praise of His glory, it's talking about the blessings, right? The first blessing, the blessing of His grace, into verse 6. The blessing of His redemption, into verse 12. Today, the blessing of His salvation, into verse 14. Every blessing we have as Christians results in one thing, or should result in one thing. The praise of His glory. And we've talked about this before on a Sunday morning. What is the glory of God? It is making much of Jesus. It is talking about Him. It is making His name known to the nations. Yes, we bring glory to Jesus in here, but we bring more glory to Jesus outside when we talk to Him with our friends. When we talk about Him to our coworkers. That's how we bring glory to God. And it starts in the middle. Verse 13. The gospel of your salvation. You have the blessing of truth. You have the blessing of belief of the gospel. And you have the blessing of the sealing and redemption. But it all takes place with the gospel. Which is again. He died on the cross. According to the scriptures for our sins. He was buried, and he was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. See, guys, here's, here's the deal. And y'all hang with me for a second, and we'll go into our time of invitation. Many of you know my testimony. I believed in the Bible for 20 plus years. I believed in my head, the Bible, the gospel of salvation, for 20 plus years. But it wasn't until I realized that that belief had to turn into a truth that I was willing to live by, that that belief turned into a truth that would be the focal point of my life, that I truly gave the gospel of salvation the time of day it deserves. In a minute, we're going to have an invitation. And I'm going to invite every single person in this room to do one of three things. The first thing is the most important. It is, it is the reason why we are here this morning. And quite frankly, it's the, reason, it's the reason why I preach the gospel. 
so somebody might get saved. If you are not saved this morning, if you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I invite you to give your life to him. And it's as simple as saying, Jesus, I confess you as Lord, and I believe in my heart you were raised from the dead. That's what scripture says. I invite you to do that. And if you're like, Brother John, I don't know how to pray. Well, I gladly invite you to come down here. Nobody will judge you, I promise you. Come down here and I will lead you in a prayer. But maybe everybody in this room is saved. But maybe you haven't been living for the Lord Jesus. You look back and you're like, man, the last two or three weeks, oof. wow, okay. Maybe you just need to recommit your life to Christ. I'd love for you to come down here and I'll pray with you. Pray for you. Or maybe you're visiting and you want to become a member of our church. Or for any other reason, I invite you to just come. If you just need prayer, I will gladly pray with you, even if you don't want to recommit your life to Christ. But this is an invitation time where I simply just want you to come as you are and respond. The invitation, in my opinion, is, is as important as the message itself. Because it is, it is your time to respond to what has been preached. And so I invite you to do that this morning. If you would stand with me. Let me open us up in a word of prayer.